Welcome to another message from Bridge Assembly, located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information on Bridge, go to our website at bridgehelena.com. It is our prayer that this message will help you to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Father, you are a good, good Father, and for so many of us, we don't even understand that. We don't even know what that means. We have problems comprehending how, how good of a Father you actually are. So Lord, today open up our hearts within that one little area. Show us the love that you have for each one of us. Lord, your commandments say to love the Lord your God above all things and likewise love your neighbor as you love yourself and so for too far too many people the loving the loving of of oneself is is a hard thing and lord god help that love that you have for us filter all the way through us so that we begin to see ourselves the way you see us lord what a wonderful thing that that truly is. Today, Lord God, we want to just lift you high. We want to exalt you. We want to praise your holy name. We want to seek your word. So fill us with these things, Lord. Continue, Lord God, continue the celebration that we started yesterday, Lord, a life celebration. It's the life each one of us can embrace. It's the hope that each one of us can embrace. So Lord, today, be glorified in our actions, in our words, in our worship, in our openness to hear and apply your word into our lives. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty name, the name that is above all names, the name that, that just the name produces hope in a hopeless world. So Jesus, be glorified. We pray this in your name and everyone shouted, Amen. You guys sounded good this morning. Wow. Nice and loud. I love it. I love it. We're going to scoot that back just for a second here. We've got special music here in just a, a few minutes, but I want to dismiss the kids if they haven't already left. They'll leave now. Awesome. All those great kids. Again today, if you have kids after service, ask them what they did today. I think you'll be surprised. It's kind of cool what they're doing. It's a mystery. And they get to solve some mysteries. So we pray for our kids. We pray for our youth that God really works in them. You know, they're up against a uh, serious battle. We, we just were reminded that uh, Friday of the, the battles that especially the high school aged kids are going through. And we Man, we need to, as a church, as, as believers, we need to stand up with the authority of Jesus and, and stand against those things because you don't want to ever have to hear those things happening in your community. If you guys were here yesterday for Sandy's life celebration, we celebrated. And it was awesome. And uh, we want to just continue that, you know, in situations like that, it does make us think we have to kind of look at ourselves and, and uh, we have to just ask ourselves some questions. I would encourage you guys to do that and, to, and if changes need to be made, make those changes. Got a couple quick announcements today. Um, the food drive is still going on. Today is bags by the bumper. And I hear the, oh, I forgot about that. It's okay. We're going to be doing another food drive in December. Um, but if you did, if hopefully you put your bags by the bumper today, the youth are going to pick those up as we speak. But the previous two Sundays, we had the Cats versus the Grizz, and I happen to have the results of the Cats versus the Grizz, and I have the whole story. So the Cats, they had 72.7 pounds of food. That's pretty good, right? It's pretty good. The Grizz had 93.1 pounds of food. 
Now the good news is that that's a total of 165.8 pounds of food that we will add to the bags by the bumper today. But getting a rundown of the competition, it sounds to me like it was a fourth quarter push for the Grizz. The, the Grizz were tailing the, for the two weeks and then um, somebody who I heard might be running sound today and and uh, is a big Grizz fan, um, maybe brought in a whole lot that, that tipped the scale. So it was a fourth quarter comeback, but everybody wins, right? Everybody wins when it comes to this. So a lot of good food. We'll get that down to Salvation Army, help them stock with what we're gathering today. Hopefully we can bless them and bless those that, that need that. And then next, uh, next uh, Friday is the prayer service. And uh, I want to really encourage you guys to come to this, invite friends to come to this. It's from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, that doesn't mean you have to come from 6 to 9 p.m. You can stop in whenever you want between 6 and 9. It's really an, kind of an interactive. We'll have six different prayer stations that'll, that'll help guide you through different aspects of prayer. Hopefully it'll reinvigorate or deepen your prayer life. So please um, put that on your calendar. Uh, going to be a good thing. I hope to see and uh, hear good results that come out of this. We'll be able to, to hang out with each other, pray with each other. If uh, the Holy Spirit moves and we, we want to do a corporate prayer, we're just going to let the Holy Spirit guide us in, in whatever aspect that He desires us to go. Those are our announcements for today. So, bags by the bumper today. Prayer service on next Friday. Be here. Please be here. And then giving, of course, we have three ways to give. You can give online at bridgehelena.com. You can use our giving boxes in the back. There's envelopes and pins there. Or you can mail it to 725 Granite Avenue. We want to always extend those options and make it as easy as possible to allow you to worship with your finances, with your tithes and offerings. Amen. We should get excited about all parts. So Give men's, men's breakfast. Oh, men's breakfast. That's right. Men's breakfast is next Saturday. Thank you for reminding me. 8.30 in the lower level here Saturday. Glenn will be cooking if that makes a difference. And it should because he's a, he's a great, great cook. But that'll be 8.30 here Downstairs, come. There's, I mean, you can eat till your heart's delight or to the detriment of your own heart because of the biscuits and gravy and breaking and all that. But it's a good time to get together and, and the men get together and share. It's, I do that because she always does that to me. Those young people, I'm telling you what. Good stuff, huh? Do you enjoy that? Yeah, you're not supposed to just enjoy it. Supposed to let it speak to you, which I know that it probably did. All right, we are going to continue with this series on First John today. And as you guys know, I've, I've talked about it before, First John is really one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I know I say that with a lot of the books of the Bible, because what's not to like except I could truthfully say that Leviticus is not one of my favorite books of the Bible, but there's so many good ones. But for me, 1 John, it, there's something about it. And the more I'm studying and the more I'm going through it, the more I am reminded why this is such a, a great book of the Bible. Are you guys enjoying this series so far? Are you guys learning anything from this series so far? Boy, I am. And hopefully... It's not just hearing and, and listening and learning, but it's actually taking that and applying it today. We're going to be stepping into some, some spots that are, are challenging, um, but really, really good. Before we get started, let me pray. Father, again, with grateful hearts, we come before you. We are asking for your guidance. We are asking for your wisdom. We are asking for your provision, your protection, your blessing, your favor. But most of all, Lord God, we are we are asking for an interaction with you, for a, to a, for a relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, allow me to speak in an appropriate way. Help me to say the things that you want me to. And Lord, if you don't want me to say them, don't let me say them. And as I always pray, 
Lord God, don't let anybody leave here today the same way that, that they walked in. Lord God, allow them to drop their baggage here at your altar and not pick it back up. Lord, if they're convicted about something, Lord God, let that conviction come to fruition. If they're seeking a, an answer to a prayer, Lord God, allow them to hear your voice today. We pray this in the mighty name of King Jesus. And everyone shouted... Amen. You guys know I like a loud church. So today, if you are moved, simply say amen, say preach it, say hallelujah, say uh-oh, say that's my neighbor, not me. Say whatever you want. At the end of service, like always, we'll have the handouts for this uh, part seven. Well, actually, we have them from part one to part seven. If you are collecting those, grab them. Um, I know some people are grabbing them for other people that watch online or don't even attend this church, which is just a great resource uh, as we go through this. I can't get through chapter two. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. There is so much good stuff that even if I intend to, hey, we'll wrap chapter 2 up this week, I, I get into a couple of verses and it's like, eh, we're not ending. If I try to end chapter 2, we're going to be in church all day Sunday, and I know some of you would love that, but not all of you. So we're going to break it down again. We're going to focus in on what needs to be focused. What I don't want to do is move so fast that we don't linger in the places that we need to linger because there is chapter 2 is pretty amazing. So as we continue this series on 1 John, um, today it seems like, at least on the surface, that, that John is seemingly going to switch gears on us a little bit. And we know from the past weeks, we know that when John wrote this, this letter, that it, that it really did have a, a dual message. First off, John is putting forth the doctrinal tests, right, or the challenges that will uh, really serve to expose the false teaching and the false claims of those who have left these churches. Now remember, many who had left, uh, they were the original founders of these churches all the way back to when these churches were planted. There was also leaders that were, were leaving. A lot of the teachers were leaving. They were buying into this this modified theology. And what was actually going on is this group that was leaving was not adding to the Scriptures. Rather, they were taking away from the Scriptures. They were diminishing the entire truth of the Gospel. And these people that had left, they had formed their own church, as we could, we could call it. I think by definition we could, we could say they formed their own cult. And they were still trying to influence those who had not left. Those who said, I am staying here, I'm planted in this church, I believe the truth is here. These that had left are still trying to get their claws in there and trying to, to pull them out. They're trying to introduce doubt. They're trying to get them to, to question the gospel message. But remember, this is the gospel message that was handed down to these churches by John himself. That's the first reason for the letter. The second reason that John wrote this letter is because John had, had an intense love for those um, and he felt the deep responsibility for everyone who was still in those churches, those who had remained. So he is not only encouraging them to stand, to stay, to continue to, to push in, but he is also challenging them as faithful followers. He's not just saying, good for you, you stayed, you're good, just keep staying. He's saying, even though you've stayed, and I thank God that you have stayed, I'm going to challenge you so you can deepen your faith even more, and you can stand against this attack upon the, the, the church in a, in a more appropriate way. John lays out some checks and balances that will help these people, and I believe it, us too, evaluate where their own faith and the depth of their relationship with Christ is, and really their current spiritual health. How many of you guys on a regular basis take your spiritual temperature, kind of evaluate your spiritual health? It's important, isn't it? Amen. It's important because if we don't, we can kind of, oh gosh, I always describe it and people think it's so funny because I say you never, you can never really see your hair grow, right? But one day you wake up and you say, my goodness, I need a haircut. I do it twice a week. 
But sometimes when we treat our, our spiritual health in that same way, we don't understand how unhealthy we've actually become because we're not evaluating on a daily basis. John's writings up until now have been concerned with sin, right? Personal sin, really, but also the sin nature of man, just the universal sin that we're born into. He's been talking about Jesus as our advocate, right? But he's also been talking about why that's so important to have Jesus as our advocate. John has also challenged us and encourages, encourages us to have action behind our words. You can't just say the things, right? People are fed up with Christians talking. It's the action that speaks way more than our words. And in here, John is really, really encouraging us and challenging us in our action to love others. That is not easy, as we talked about last week. It's not easy to love a lot of people. And only because of Jesus can we love others. But that's the action that the world is looking for. Last week, we ended with John encouraging uh, these churches as well as us by addressing them as three different categories, right? Little children, young men, and fathers. And if you remember, uh, this really pertains to, to uh, the maturity of our faith and it illustrates the gross process that we as Christians need to strive for. When we, when we form a relationship, when we first come to Christ, we're, we're young children, right? We're babies in our faith. But we're not supposed to stay babies. And the natural maturing process is that we, we strengthen our faith and we, we get stronger and we become like a young man full of energy and, and strength and, and just want to go and you just want to tell the whole world about Jesus. But we don't want to stop there as well. We want to continue to mature into that, that idea of fathers where there's a responsibility, right? We say, hey, I'm not just going to church here, but I'm actually part of this church. I'm not just part of this church, but I want to be part of what this church is doing. We begin to say, hey, I could, I could teach the kids on a Sunday. I could, I could help with a men's breakfast. I could help in women's ministry. I could help in all these different things. So, so becoming a father, um, that season in our faith is very important. Fathers also are the ones who are really... Um, fervent with the doctrine of the church. No, we're not going there. We are not going there. That is unbiblical. Where in the Bible does it say that? So fathers have this greater understanding because they've studied the word longer. I encourage you, you, you young children in your faith, to push forward and, and enter that, that young men, women segment of your faith. And if you're in, the, in that segment, I, I encourage you to keep pushing forward into this leadership, this, this seasoned, wise segment of your faith life. I'm waiting to get there. I know my beard is turning gray, but in so many ways, it's hard to feel like you've attained that portion. And with humility, we just ask God that he continues to speak to us. What a great passage that passage is in, in Scripture. Um, chapter 2, verses, you know, right around 14 where, where he's talking about that. And it should serve as an encouragement to you personally to, to really press on, to never stop growing in your faith and never stop seeking the Lord. If I could encourage you one thing today, it's to never stop seeking the Lord. But now as we move into chapter 2, verse 15, we switch from striving to grow in God to talking about what I would say is the, the challenges of, of living in this world. How many of you guys know there's a few challenges when it comes to living in this world? There's a whole lot of challenges. We don't really truly understand those challenges unless we continue to push in and get closer to God. So let's take a look. First John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the, the love of the Father is not in him. Once again, John is, is being bold with his words here. He's saying there really is no, 
middle ground. John is drawing a, a distinct line here between the really the dominion of the world and the dominion of God. And just so we don't forget, remember with God's economy, there is nothing that is neutral. Light or dark, saved or unsaved, obedient or defiant, truth or lie, heaven or hell, love or hate. And now John brings in the kingdom of the world or the kingdom of God. So let's define, before we go any further, let's define this word we're using, world. Um, this term, let's use it to describe those things here on earth that operate in denial, defiance, or in the absence of God. When we're talking about the world, we're not, we're not talking about it in a in a physical sense, but really we're talking about it in a spiritual sense. So the world is anything that operates in denial, defiance, or in absence of God. We must also understand how important the structure of this letter is. John keeps building upon topic. Topic upon topic upon topic to guide the reader in a useful and practical instruction. Right. So though we are breaking First John down and down and down and we can't seem to get through chapter 2, I would encourage you guys, because First John is a quick read on maybe a weekly basis, don't forget to go back and read the entire book as we go through this. John has assured the faithful in these these churches of their position before God. Their sins have been forgiven. They know the Father by way of the Son. They have overcome the evil one because of their strength in the authority of Jesus Christ. They know the gospel and who God is from the beginning. And John has challenged them to love and clearly defined what true love actually looks like and should look like. Now John moves to application within their lives outside the walls of the church. Isn't that an important distinction? He's challenging them to love clearly outside the walls of the church. Because listen closely here. If we are not careful, we can construct for ourselves a life inside the church that looks very different from our life outside the church. Now, come on, guys. Because you know this is true. It's really easy to do. I want to remind everybody in here that pastors aren't as naive as you might think we are. Especially now that everybody's on social media. Hey, if we're friends on social media, you need to understand I can see everything that you post. Words, pictures, videos. All of those things. And John here... He, he wasn't naive either. That's why this is helpful as well as, as a convincing uh, passage of Scripture. It's important here to understand that John is speaking to Christians here. This statement is targeted toward Christians. He is speaking to those who have professed their faith in Christ and have a relationship with the Father. He is not speaking to the unbeliever. To the unbeliever, these words make no sense. They have no weight. For the unbeliever, there is nothing but the world. And therefore, there is nothing to aspire to that is above the world's standards. You tell me, golly, it's not hard to figure out why the world is hopeless. The world is hopeless is because... They're basing everything upon their own standards. And their standards are terrible. When we get Christ in our life, those standards are shattered. Jesus brings something completely new to us. Something to aspire to. He speaks to us about eternity, eternal life. He speaks to us about change within our own life. He speaks to us about the ability to not only love Him, but to love ourselves and to love others. And I'm telling you, that changes everything. You go from hopeless to hopeful. 
no middle ground. You go from darkness to light. You go from hate to love. John is warning those who have remained in these churches as, as well as us to not love the world. And he gives two big reasons why we are not to do this. First, when we love the world, it impedes or deters our love for the Father. That is just putting it out there straight. We can't sugarcoat this. If we have a desire or we choose to love the world, that impedes us. That actually deters us. It distracts us from our love for the Father. Once we allow the world in, it seeks to draw us in further. And as we go in further, we wind up being further away from God until He is but a memory. Hey, do you, do you remember when we used to all go to church? Hey, do you remember when, back when, when you'd actually have a Sunday night service? Hey, do you remember when um, um, we would all get together on Wednesday nights and have a meal and, and then we would go into small groups and learn more about God? Do you remember all those things? Hey, I remember when... You guys remember when we used to pray before we ate? Do you remember that? Hey, I remember um, when my kids were little, little, I would share Bible stories with them, but then they, they got to the point where they just didn't want to hear stories. They wanted to put themselves to bed. And, and hey... Here's a good one. Do you guys remember before COVID? You guys remember that? This is a serious one. Hey, you remember how many people used to come to church before COVID? Do you remember those things? See, we get so focused on the world and things within the media, things, chaotic things that happen like, like a pandemic and, and things like, like a toilet paper shortage, for goodness sakes. We start to focus on these worldly things and it draws us further and further away from God unless you have securely placed your feet on the foundational rock of Christ. Then within those situations, it actually turns you closer to God. It depends on where your priority system is. It depends on where you're looking. Are you looking to the world or are you looking to God? Now, the second thing that, that, that John is saying here, and, and really the best way to put this is that uh, loving the world is a bad investment. We hear a lot of things on social media. We hear them on commercials about investments, right? How many of you guys in the last 24 hours have gotten a phone call about your car's extended warranty? Right? Because your car's an investment and you need to look at it as an investment. But when we're looking at the world versus the kingdom of God, the world and putting your efforts toward the world is it's a bad investment. It's a bad investment of our time. It's a bad investment of our talents, of our finances. It's a bad investment of our energy. See, loving the world or investing in the world is meaningless because the world is passing away. And this serves as another basic test as to where you are in your faith. Where does your love for the world rank compared to your love for the Father? If you were here yesterday during Sandy's celebration, you you probably gained an understanding of how intent Sandy was on investing in the kingdom versus investing in the world. The world didn't have a whole lot of, of influence upon Sandy because it was about God. It was about relationships. It was about eternity. And we need, to, we need to, to think about those things. So we do have to ask ourselves, where does my love for the world and the things of this world compared to my love for the Father. But when you think about these things, we don't want to think about them, but when we do think about them, we, we kind of say, can't we just have some middle ground here? Just a little middle ground here? Because I really like this. I really like my car. I really love my car. I really, really like my boat. I really love going camping. Boy, I really love that hamburger from this place. And, and we, we use these different terms and these, these different words because we want a little bit of middle ground here. 
Because after all, isn't there enough love to go around? Can't I love God and love the world all at the same time? Well, I'm so glad you guys asked that question. Because Jesus himself answered this question. Look at Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. That, to me, sounds like Jesus himself started this, hey, there's no middle ground type of thing, right? It's one or the other. How about Mark 3.25, and if a house is divided against its health, that house will not be able to stand powerful words, powerful truths right there. Those things that are glorifying and full of God cannot exist with those things that operate in defiance or in the absence of God. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Light and dark don't mix. Amen. When light comes into the dark, it's no longer dark. Light takes over. There is no middle ground. Now we know that God spoke this world into existence. We know that, don't we? He created it to be good, to be beautiful, to be full of life. And he created the world in a way that gives glory back to himself. We know that in John 3.16, Jesus said that God so loved the world. And, and somebody who is really mixed up with their theology could say, see, God loves the world. Why can't I? See, God loves his creation. Those that are separated from himself because of sin and who are living in the darkness, he desires always that he pulls them to himself. And that's a constant desire that he says that, 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 that none shall perish, that none shall be lost, that none shall remain in darkness. Jesus wants to rescue mankind from eternal death. And it's through the blood of Jesus that that happens. But what God originally created changed dramatically through the sin of Adam and Eve. There's a fly that just died. No, he's not dead all the way. Anybody want to fly? That was weird. It's spring. Praise the Lord. We got through winter. So what God had originally created, right, in the, in the Garden of Eden, the six days of creation, Adam and Eve, hey, it's not good for you to be alone, Adam. Here's a help mate. Now go forth and fill the world. Name all the animals. Everything is good. There's no death. But there was a choice made through the temptation of, of the evil one, and Adam and Eve fell. And with that, the world became an evil place, a place under the grip of Satan himself. I'm sorry to inform you, but the world is not getting better. The world is very much getting worse. Amen. It's getting more evil by the day. And now we must choose and align ourselves with one or the other. It's one or the other. You've got to do it. There is no default choice. Yeah, none of the above. You know, it's like on those multiple choice exams. All of the above or none of the above? No, you can't. You can't do that. You have to make a choice. Not making a choice is a choice in its own as well. So you can't just say, hey, I'm, I'm opting out. You can't opt out. It's really that black and white. James 4.4 4 says this, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. Ouch, Ouch is right. That's a hard one, huh? It's one or the other, guys. It's one or the other. And the sooner we choose, the sooner we continue on our maturing process. If you're just like, man, I just feel like I'm stuck as a, as a baby Christian. I'm just stuck there. Well, there's several things going on. Number one, you're not desiring to mature any more than you are. And number two, you might be desiring to combine the kingdom of God and the world into one thing. 
Now let's move on to 1 John 2.16. It says this, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. That says it pretty good right there, but I want to throw up the amplified version as well. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual cravings of the flesh and the lust and longing of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things, we could say worldly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. Boy, that is amplified, isn't it? See, the cravings of a sinful man seeking the world, they're going to fit into these three categories. It's the desire of the flesh, it's the desire of the eyes, and it's the pride of life. Desires of the flesh describe this overall principle of worldliness, it's an outlook oriented or consumed with self. It's me. It's all about me. Earth revolves around me. I'm, I'm a God unto my own universe, right? It's what we fight against all the time. See, a selfish or self-centered outlook Pursues a life that seeks to be self-sufficient and independent of God. I don't need God. I make all the decisions. I'm better off on my own. But also, a self-sufficient and independent to anyone and everyone else. I take that attitude with God. I'm taking that attitude with everyone else. In other words, it's all about me. Anything outside of me and my selfish interests only serve as a means to satisfy myself. And you're sitting there saying, but what about those people that have to rely on everyone else? Where do they fit in? Well, they're relying on everyone else in order to satisfy themselves. See how it all comes together here? Now, when you put it like that, it sounds so nasty. But I want you guys to be aware because it's really sneaky. It's really sneaky. The serpent went into the garden. He was cunning. Cunning is another name for sneaky. I know, it makes me sound really smart when I say sneaky. But the enemy is sneaky. The world is sneaky. And it wants to distract you and to divert you and to entice you over here. If it happened to Adam and Eve, it can happen to any of us. So a self-centric life can be based out of anything that runs contrary to God, including fear, anger, guilt, entitlement, unforgiveness, or pride. It's those things that, that sneak into our lives. Boy, you deserve it. It's okay to use that person and to hurt that person to get to where you want to go because you're better than them. Hey, you need to do that because if you don't, all this other stuff's going to come and get you. You better do what you need to do. See, there's all this ungodly stuff that influences us and causes us to want to worship the world. Pursuing the desires of the flesh is is a basis for rebellion against God and leads to this materialistic, self-centered, envious, exploitative selfishness. It is the root of bigotry, racism, sexism, power, atheism, hate, neglect, and every unrighteous practice. But it doesn't end there. The desires of the eyes Desires of the eyes means everything that can attract, can tempt, or can seduce your eyes, which then seduces you. Things that are seen quickly captivate and produce the mindset of desires and greed. To Eve, when tempted by the serpent, it says that the fruit was a, it was delightful to her eye, right? She saw the fruit. Oh, that fruit looks good. He got her focus on how good that fruit looked. And then he just had to sit back and throw these little words in there. 
But she was so focused, the desires of her eyes. There's this interesting person in the Bible. His name is David. He became a king. He was a warrior. He slayed Goliath and had many great victories. And in his, in his time when he was so victorious and his men went out to battle, he, with his eyes, looked lustfully at Bathsheba as she bathed on the roof next to his. In both of these examples, it was the desire of the eyes that initiated and compelled the actions that followed. The world will always tempt us, tempt us with the things that we see. Oh, did you see that brand new car? Mm, I think I need that. Ooh, check her out. Mm. I want to look a certain way. Oh, my, I need a new haircut. I think it would make me feel better. It's the eyes that start all these different things. And that brings us to the pride of life. Or as the Amplified puts it, the pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things. Isn't that a weird way to put it? Because there is no stability in earthly things. There is no way to truly put our confidence in our own resources, is there? That's the last thing I want to do is putting, putting my confidence in my own abilities or my own resources or the earthly things. Have you guys ever been around those people who want to only talk about their success? What they have accumulated? Well, have you seen what I just bought? Or what they have done? Bragging about their possessions or their status among other people? See, it's all about his or her importance. Their wealth or their fame. I'm a self-made man. I did this all on my own. See, pride is a serious problem. I'm going to say this, pride is a serious problem even for the believer. James 4.16 As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What part of that boasting is evil? All of it? Could we say 100%? Could we say there's not a whole lot of room for middle ground here? Here's a little fun test for us. Uh oh, I love that. Oh, I've been waiting for that so long. <laughs> Ask yourself, does your reputation, your accomplishments, your status, or your image matter more to you than what God has done in you? If so, then this value system has most likely become the standard that you are basing not only yourself upon, but what you are basing others upon. It's not fair to those other people. You don't judge them by their checkbook. You don't judge them by the job that they work. As Christians, we don't do that. We can't do that. See, pride of life is the same as worshiping the idol of self. And again, the reasons people fall into this are many, but most of the time it's based in fear, envy, greed, and unforgiveness. How might you know if you are walking a little too close with that line of the pride of, of life? It's actually pretty easy. It will be reflected in what whatever status symbols are important to you or seem to define your identity. Ouch! That's a hard one. One of the biggest things that, that I noticed, I don't care if I offend people, I'm beyond that. One of the things that I noticed when we moved to Montana was this idea of, did you move to Montana or were you born in Montana? Well, if you were born in Montana, how many generations are you? You're only two generations? <laughs> I'm four generations. Oh, you're six generations? And, and this standard is, is, is built on this geographic area that you happen to, to live in. Now, again, you know, all the Californians come and we can, that's a whole different story. 
we got seats for them. Let's fill these this up. Because them California people, a lot of them are dry. They need a little bit of Jesus. Oh, good catch, Alvin. Um, but that's what can define our, our identity. It's, it's that simple. It's not always our bank account. It's not always our job. It's not always our accomplishments. Sometimes it's our last name. Sometimes it's how long we've lived in an area. Sometimes it's how we dress, right? You should never define yourselves by the standards of others. See, that's what the world seeks to do. Because if you do, 100% of the time you will always fall short. We, as Christians, must understand that without Christ, we are absolutely nothing. But with Christ, His identity becomes our confidence, and our status symbol becomes that of Christ Himself. Let my status symbol be nothing more than He was a follower of Jesus. That's it. For me, it doesn't matter the size of the church. It doesn't matter where the church is. It doesn't matter how much money the church just brought in. Doesn't matter about any of those things. All I need on my gravestone is that he was a follower of Christ. Because Christ himself is my status symbol. That brings us to verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The moment that Adam and Eve gave in to their temptation and sinned against God, death or the process of dying entered this world. At that very moment, the world started to die. As a result, from that point on, the world began to pass away. All this that we see right now, this materialistic stuff, it will pass away. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, they are a terrible investment because there cannot be a return on them in an eternal sense. There can't be a return. You just threw all that, you just threw it away. But maybe that's the problem in itself. Maybe we are not thinking with an eternal mindset. Or maybe we're just not thinking with an eternal mindset Enough. Look at Matthew 6, starting in 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasures in heaven could be defined as whatever is of good and eternal significance. Things like kindness, a willingness to help others, witnessing, testifying to who Jesus Christ is and what He's done in your life, suffering for Christ's sake, forgiving others. Both of those, those last two are big, one, aren't, big ones, aren't they? Did you know that when we forgive others, that lays up a treasure in heaven. That's an eternal mindset, an eternal perspective. If you've got somebody to forgive, for goodness sake, forgive them. Suffering for Christ's sake, it's like, well, at least I don't live in Afghanistan right now because you'd really have to suffer for Christ's sake. But I'm telling you, it's here, it's now. In your jobs, at your schools. Any time that we have to make a choice, Am I going to stand up for God in this situation or stand up with the world? If we stand up for God, we are suffering for Christ's sake. And I don't think we can oversimplify these scriptures to say that money or fame or status is inherently evil. I say that because there are people out there, my goodness, there's people in here who have used and continue to use their money, their fame, or their status in a positive way that does in fact make an eternal impact. Listen, 
God has blessed each and every one of us with unique gifts. And we are to operate within those gifts. All to the glory of God. Laying up treasure in heaven because we have an eternal perspective. So it comes down to where one's heart is and where they're investing. And that goes for everyone. The world seeks your attention. It wants to pledge yourself. It wants you to pledge yourself to it. Did you know that? Though the world seems fun and it's just like carefree, the world is seeking that you pledge your alliance to the world. The reward for doing that is eternal death. See, the world seeks to distract and confuse you in your relationship with God. We must determine within our own life and within our faith to pr pursue Christ and to set our thoughts, our motives, our actions upon the eternal standard the Father has handed down to us. He handed it down to us through Scripture. He handed it down through us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He handed it down to us through the church, the body of believers. Is it easy? <laughs> In this day and age? Absolutely not. Could you imagine if, if the disciples and apostles were, were writing the Bible today? <laughs> right? To the church of United States of America. Cali let's see, if it's Corinthians, it would be like Californians. That'd be like books 1 through 10 right there. No, it's not easy. Not in this day and age because everything is stacked up against us. But is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, only you can answer that question for yourself. Every time we choose to operate in the middle ground, we're really choosing to operate in the world or in the darkness. Worship team, if you guys want to come up. Hopefully, for each person in here today, that this is a lot to think about. It really is. I get to wrestle with this for weeks at a time. And then I get to deliver it to you, and I get to pass this along to you, and now, now it's there for you. You can take it. You can marinate in it. You can think it over. You can apply it. Or you can brain dump it. I don't have power to determine what you do with this. All I can do is encourage you to get before God, to allow the Holy Spirit and to mature in your faith, to continue forward, continue pressing in to God. And allow Him to continue to expand Himself through His Word, through your prayer life, and through the edification of, of good Christian people that you are a, around. We're going to close with at least one song. I wouldn't mind closing with several songs, to tell you the truth, because I'm in, I'm in worship mode. Man, I'm like, man, well, well, then let's talk about this. Let's just, let's just get up and let's sing about it. Sing about how great God is in our life. We're going we're gonna to sing this song, right? What a powerful name it is. What a powerful song that is. What a powerful statement that is. We're saying, in essence, I am choosing God over this world because within God's economy, within God's kingdom, it's life, it's love, it's powerful, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. Wow. And we all just agree right now to stand up to get before God to pray and to sing this out like maybe we've never sung out before. If you have, if you have things, if you need to dump things at the altar, if you need to ask forgiveness, if you need prayer, there are people in here this morning to pray with you. Don't let moments like this pass you by. God wants to touch you right now. The Holy Spirit wants to remind you, to convict you, to confirm to change you. But remember, there is no middle ground. It's either God or this world. One leads to life and one leads to death. If everybody would, would stand up, go ahead and bring the lights down. We're going to pray. 
and then man, we are going to worship. We are going to worship. We are going to express what God has done in our lives. We are going to, we're going to sing out in preparation of what God is about to do in our lives. Do you believe it? I believe it. Father, you are so wonderful. Lord, how the Bible, the scriptures just confirm one another. What an amazing, alive book. Help us to be in this great book more often than we probably are because everything lies within there. Lord, help us to live a life where we are consumed by You. That we want everything that, that You have for us. That it's not, it's not good enough just being a Christian that sits in church one day a week. But we truly want to be the kind of Christian that convenes with You on a not just a daily basis, but a second-by-second second basis. That we have a hunger and a desire to serve You. Not because of what You might be able to give us, but Lord God, because of how wonderful You actually are. None of us deserve the mercy and the grace that You've extended to us. But by Your love, we can step into that and live within that. Jesus, be glorified with this worship. Help it to come from our hearts in spirit and in truth because Jesus, we love You. We pray this in the name of our King Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is that we can speak. What a powerful name it is that affects how we live our life. Amen. It is so time in this craziness of this world for the church to start getting excited about the powerful name of Jesus. It is time for the church to go to the highways and the byways. If there is an open seat around you, it needs to be filled. So do whatever it takes to fill that seat. Drag people to church if you need to. Invite them. Encourage them. Have coffee with them several times before. But it's time for the church to rise up in the powerful name of Jesus. And we need to start understanding that it is black or white. There is no middle ground. We can't continue to try to operate in that middle ground. Let's start pulling people away from hell and darkness and into the kingdom by the power, authority, and blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. Amen. This concludes today's message. We hope you can join us next Sunday for services beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at Bridge Assembly located at 725 Granite Avenue in Helena, Montana. For more information about Bridge Assembly, go to bridgehelena.com and we hope you can join us next Sunday with Pastor Jason Metz.